I'm Jeremy with Poindexter G, and today we're going to talk about how Garand beat out the Pedersen. So to get into this Pedersen versus Garand thing, let me tell you a little bit about both of the men that are involved with this. We'll start off with John Pedersen. Now John Pedersen, by the time that he came on the scene to work with um, the military on designing a rifle, he was already kind of a rock star designer. Um, he had a number of different things that he had started working with, um, most of those being done through the Remington Company. Now he had developed a number of things including the Model 51 pistol, the Model 10 pump shotgun, and the Models 12, 14, and 25 pump action rifles. He had started work prior to World War I on a 45 caliber pistol. This would be something that he would hope would replace the um, 1911 as the standard issue sidearm. But once World War I came along and the United States got involved in it, they weren't wanting to develop a new pistol at this point. They just wanted to mass produce what they already had. And so that project was kind of dropped. Now, one thing that Pedersen did actually successfully get made for the U.S. military was the Pedersen device. And the Pedersen device, this is a weird, quirky little thing. Now, they knew that during World War I, they were having to go around and clear out trenches. What if we had something that had a really light cartridge and was semi-auto? And that thing would just rock in these trenches to be able to clear out stuff. And you get with the idea of a Pedersen device, which is not a separate rifle, but it's basically remove the bolt from the 1903, slide in the Pedersen device, then like take this stick mag and plug into it. And basically you now had, as a 1903, it was semi-auto with this big 30 round mag that had like a small pistol caliber, 30 caliber cartridge that they made for this. They were going to use it, but it ended up the war kind of ended and then just nothing else really ever came of it. They were just kind of done with it at that point, but it did get him very much noticed by the military. But he was known to the people there at the army. He was known amongst gun designers. He had done quite a lot at this point. Another really well-known gun designer that he had worked with briefly, John Moses Browning. Well, Browning stated that Pedersen was the greatest gun designer in the world. And that is quite an endorsement there because I think most people would recognize that John Moses Browning was probably the greatest gun designer ever. So if he's saying that Pedersen is great, then Pedersen really is something. Now this is going to be versus John Garand. John Garand was a French Canadian immigrant. He'd come over, he'd been working in shops, started working for Springfield Armory. Um, wasn't really well known, but was competent, so he moved up. He had started working on a full auto rifle for the United States, um, but just like Pedersen's pistol, once World War I came along, they weren't interested in changing over to something else. It's just time to double down on what we got and just make a ton of those. And so that whole project kind of stopped and he ended up um, getting tasked to develop a self-loading rifle after World War I. And initially when they were looking at auto loaders, they had developed it off of the 30 6 cartridge because that's what they had in the 1903 and they wanted to stay with that. And they had Garin's original design that he had, um, which actually had this weird primer actuated thing where the force of the primer popping out would actually make the bolt go back and pick up the next round, which was kind of interesting and odd. Um, in addition to that, they had two other rifles. They had one from Thompson. This is the Thompson who is known for the Thompson submachine gun or the Tommy gun. And they had something known as the Bang rifle. Yes, this is a rifle literally named Bang. Um, it was a Danish guy that designed it and his last name was Bang, which I guess doesn't sound weird if you're Danish. And they looked at all those and really 
they weren't happy with any of the three. Um, Garen's had the weird primer actuated thing that they weren't happy with. That was going to be problematic because it was going to make it have to have different rounds from everything else. It was going to be 30-06, but it was going to have different primers, and those primers weren't going to be able to work um, in the BAR or anything else that took it. And really, all three of them were just kind of big and unwieldy. They were just heavy. They had this 30-06 round. They were all getting beat up from having to deal with 30-06, and none of them were really ideal for what they wanted. And so it's this point in 1923 where Pedersen comes into the scene. And so Pedersen gives them a proposal, and what he told them was that they needed to use a smaller caliber. Now, this is something that sounds like completely reasonable nowadays. We know that that's what it was going to go to now that we've got the 223 slash 556 round. Yeah, definitely moving smaller caliber was definitely the way to go with it. Well, at the time, that sounded a little crazy. And they knew that Pedersen was like, he's a gun designer rock star, but they're still not sure about this idea of a smaller caliber. So they go out and they do the pig board this was a nickname but this was a board that was supposed to test out um, how well a smaller caliber would actually work and they did this on anesthetized pigs so yeah that's great guess it's better than shooting people but they found that smaller calibers when they were loaded up to like full rifle power cartridges were actually pretty effective and it made a lot less recoil and it made smaller rounds that weighed less and it made the whole size of the firearm be able to shrink down. And so they told Pedersen, all right, go ahead and go along with this smaller cartridge idea. And so he developed the 276 Pedersen cartridge and that's what he started designing a rifle in. So they also go ahead and have John Garand, since he like works for Springfield, which is the government, they're like, hey, why don't you go ahead and take a rifle and design that in this 276 Pedersen? So he starts designing a rifle. And so now you've got the two different rifles there. Now Garand's rifle was what was essentially the um, M1 that was later picked up and adopted um, just in the 276 cartridge. Um, that made it a little bit smaller and also meant that they could put 10 rounds into the end block clip. Now, Pedersen's rifle, he was trying to come up with a very different type of action on it. And what he came up with was a toggle lock action. And this toggle lock was this weird thing that would pop up and down. It looks pretty much like the action on top of a Luger pistol, except this is just on a rifle. They were really wanting things developed with a M-block clip. They wanted that clip versus a um, detachable magazine just because of the cost of it. They thought that you know, the guys out there would be losing magazines all the time and it would just the cost of them would just shoot up from losing those magazines versus the clips which were pretty disposable. And, and so by 1926, both Pedersen and Garand have their prototypes and their prototypes are running. And there ended up being a few things that were kind of problems with the Pedersen. The first one is that weird toggle lock that we talked about. That was, um, everything had to be really, really finely machined. And when you have to start machining things that finely, the cost of the rifle starts going up and up. And when this is a military contract that needs to be made, you know, in thousands, if not millions, this is really going to be an issue as that price keeps going up. They had to have wax coated cartridges and also the clip on the Pedersen um, can only be inserted one direction. It couldn't be flipped around and inserted the other way which means you could start to put it in there upside down and have your gun not work until you pull it out and flip it around and stick it back in versus Garen's design which the clip could be flipped around either direction. Now, in spite of these issues, just because of this gun designer rock star a reputation that Pedersen had, they were really looking at that and really wanting to go with his. I think they kind of just got sucked into the you know, rock star status of Pedersen and were just kind of like, yeah, we can work around these problems that he's having there. But, you know, 
Garen's gun's pretty good. That's pretty good. But Pedersen, man, that's, I mean, it, it, it's John Pedersen. So in April of 1928, the infantry board recommends the adoption of the Pedersen rifle. They have officially put that forward. Well, there was someone that didn't agree with that, and that was the Ordnance Board. Now, the Ordnance Board was basically in charge of ordnance, but one thing they had to make sure of was being able to, to distribute ammunition for everybody out there. And they did not like the idea of having two different types of ammo they were going to have to put out there now. They're going to have to put out .30-06 and this 276 Patterson. They liked having the BIR and the standard battle rifle have the same cartridge at 30 out 6 and they wanted to stay with 30 out 6 and so they managed to convince the Army Chief of Staff. The Army Chief of Staff at this point is some guy named Douglas MacArthur. Yes, that Douglas MacArthur that you know from World War II. Um, they managed to convince him that they absolutely could not afford to go with two different cartridges and so Army Chief of Staff, Douglas MacArthur, puts down the decision that this new rifle is going to be in 30-06. Now, this decision right here is what ended up sealing the deal for Garen. Pedersen kind of thought that he had this thing in the bag and that he was done. And so he's off, like, out of the country in Europe, like, starting to try to sell this to other countries because, you know, he wants to get everybody to buy, he wants to get everybody to buy this uh, Pedersen rifle that he's designed. And he's just, like, completely caught off guard on this and not prepared at all to be able to redesign this thing in 30-06. Well, John Garand, having, like, worked with the government a lot at this point through Springfield Armory, kind of suspected that something like this was going to happen and he had been working on designing a version of this in 30-06. Now he did not have a functioning 30-06 rifle at this point but he already had some designs and had already done a lot of preliminary work on it so when they told him they had to go to 30-06 and asked him if he could do it he's like yeah we're not far off of being able to adapt that this will move over easy and Pedersen was just like what 30-06 dude you told me 276. We're doing it in 276. That's what we designed on. And that pretty much ended it there. Um, when Pedersen told them that he could not quickly adapt the thing to 30 out 6, they're like, well, okay, I guess we're not going to listen to this Pedersen anymore. And it pretty much just came the um, John Guerin's design that was looked at at that point. And it still took some more time to work out everything on it, but they did eventually get it worked out. They rolled it out as the M1 rifle, and fortunately for the United States, they got this all finished up before World War II broke out, so they had it available for World War II. And there we have General George Patton's greatest battle implement of all time rolling out there and being the rifle that was used. So if you found this video interesting, be sure to give it a thumbs up and a like. You can also go down to the comment section and tell me anything that you think about this video in a comment you can leave. And you can also subscribe to my channel and make sure that you don't miss any of the videos that I post and catch everything. I'm Jeremy with Poindexter G and we'll see you next time.